What's going on, everybody? It's that time again. It's the Sooners Illustrated Podcast, episode 22 on this Thursday, September 28th, 2023. Josh Calloway, Colin Kennedy, Tom Green, and James D. Jackson will be along in just a little bit. CK, how you doing, my man? I'm great. Uh, you changed up the intro on me, so now I'm a little thrown did off I? my game. What did, I do? what did I do? I didn't even notice. You're normally a uh, we're back type of guy, and I, what did you just hit me with? Something like, it's that time again. So I, oof, You got to keep it on the Anyway. No, man, I'm good. Look, another week of football, right? I, only one high school game this week for me, so I get to decompress just a little bit. Sure. And then final Big 12 home opener for Oklahoma. Josh, like, I don't know if, how – it's really weird to think about for me all week. I don't know how you're feeling about it, but it's it's been strange, especially with the two of us being around this beat for a while. Like, kind of kind of weird that this is the last time we're going to get that introductory Big 12 Conference game in Norman for a long time, basically forever. And then speaking of that too, right. Josh, a little, little fun note, in the move to the SEC, before that Iowa State-Oklahoma kick at 6 o'clock, I'm going to go do some some scouting – at Arkansas A&M at 11 o'clock in the morning. Nice. At at and Stadium. So, going to go see two teams, I'm sure, that, that Oklahoma and those two squads are very excited to get those games going as soon as next season. But, yeah, man, another week of football. Excited to talk about it. Yeah, I was wondering if they still played that at at AT&T Stadium. That's a cool cool game, that Arkansas and uh, A&M game. Yeah, no, I haven't really thought about it that way. But now we're really getting to the part of the year where it's kind of – it really feels like last time. Because, like, last week didn't really feel like a Big 12 game for obvious reasons because it was Cincinnati. But, you yeah. know, I've, I've covered or just attended Oklahoma playing Iowa State a lot of times. So it's weird that this will be the last time. I've been to Ames twice. Uh, so I've seen them play in Norman several times. So, yeah, kind of funky that – I mean, who knows the next time OU will play Iowa State. I mean, it, it could be – I mean, decades and decades and de- maybe never. I don't know. Uh, yeah, like I, I genuinely don't know if we're going to see OU Iowa State again. And like, I'm pretty sure Oklahoma at Iowa State was our first Big Twelve road game to cover together when we were students. In so eighteen, just, yeah, that game was I don't hot. Know, man. It's it, that was toasty. I mean, we were sweating. <laughs> it was it was better for the two of us being down on the field than in the press box. But anyway, yeah. I, I digress. Yeah, it's just it's been weird to me to think about kind of the the lasts that are coming down the barrel. Plus, I mean, happened upon those free tickets for Arkansas A&M, and I'm like, those are going to be conference foes as soon as next year, man. It's We're getting into weird times. Yeah, for sure. No, it, it, it is kind of uh, like a, like you kind of pointed out. It does feel weird that we're really getting to the final goal round, um, you know, after Iowa State final time playing, you know, you not you. I mean, UCF's a bad example, I guess, after the bye week. But then after that, you know, Kansas final time, you know, West Virginia final time, last bedlam. That'll be uh, kind of as we go. The nostalgia will kick up more and more and more as we go along, I guess. But looking forward to this weekend. Excited to be back home. Kind of like you're saying, um, a little of a catch your breath week. It's kind of the same for us. I mean, back to back road games. Obviously, Tulsa's not a crazy road game, but it is a road game. And then, yeah, the Cincinnati trip was fun. But obviously, anytime you do those big, you have to actually hop in a plane. It kind of takes a little bit out of you. So excited to be back home this weekend. Texas game next week. Uh, everybody's fired up for that. we got to get through this one first. Oklahoma, Iowa State this weekend. Of course, we will preview the game in full. We'll get Colin Sots and then James and Tom will be along just a bit for the full game preview and breakdown. But, of course, it's CK's here, our lead recruiting analyst. We have some recruiting things we want to hit off the top, as we usually do on these Thursday shows. Let's start with an update on Reggie Powers, a name that Oklahoma fans are uh, starting to become acquainted with in the last week or so. So Reggie Powers, if you're unfamiliar, is a four-star composite safety from Dayton, Ohio. He's been a Michigan State commit since June, but he gets off from Oklahoma last, I believe that was Friday. Mm-hmm. And then earlier this week on Tuesday, decommits from Michigan State. So obviously a lot of people naturally you go, okay, got the you offer a few days later, Michigan state decommit comes through. Where does Oklahoma stand in trying to get this kid, this 2024 safety and add to what's obviously been a, a really strong, especially defensive class in 24 and maybe add another name to the fold here. Yeah. Th- this is something that the world of college football and, and recruiting are going to have to follow closely. Right. I mean, the, the Michigan state developments, are our key as other programs try to figure out how that impacts them, whether that be the transfer portal or, of course, as we're talking about, 
future takes in recruiting. I mean, this this Michigan State 2024 class did have a decent amount of talent, and Reggie Powers was a big part of that. Longtime pledge, like you mentioned, and they wanted this guy for good reason. Six foot one, 200 pounds, big physical guy, already filled out pretty well. And when the offer came through, especially on that Friday, I believe, that you mentioned, I had a lot of people text me being like, what does this mean for Michael Boganowski? <laughs> what, does this mean KU and Kansas State can run away? So here's what I'll say about this. I think that Oklahoma saw an opportunity to – how do I want to put this? Maybe maybe enter a race that it doesn't necessarily have to storm right out of the gate in, if that makes sense. They're, sure. they're going to monitor Reggie Powers. It's clear to me that they feel he fits this defensive scheme very well. And rightfully so. I mean, it's 6'1", 200, the way he plays. I think he can play high safety. I think he can play into the box. I think he can play the cheetah. And so you're always looking for those kind of guys, especially right. when you're a defensive system like Brent Venables. So that being said, though, the, the guy that has been towards the top, at least down the stretch, is Michael Boganowski, the versatile safety linebacker out of the state of Kansas. And I do think that this offer – has a little bit to do with Boganowski in the sense that Oklahoma is going to continue to pursue Michael, and rightfully so. I mean, the guy's incredibly talented, great off-field character. Like, he's exactly what Brent has wanted, and he's been cheetah tier 1A in this cycle for Oklahoma for a long time. But we know Kansas State's long had several advantages to their own right, and Kansas has made things really interesting. So – entering the race for Reggie Powers, you kind of get to start seeing and, and feeling things out here as he sort of reevaluates his <clears throat> recruitment. But, I, I mean, out of the gate, I'm led to believe that, that Brandon Hall, Oklahoma's incredibly talented safeties coach, has made a really strong impression on Powers. I, I know that he would like to go ahead and take a visit to Oklahoma, but he said on social media himself he's still trying to figure out what all of this looks like next. Yeah, And when it comes to the Sooner side of the equation, like they're probably also in the same boat. They want to try and figure out the ideal opportunity to maybe get him on campus, talk to him a little bit more in person, run through some scenarios while also obviously courting Michael Boganowski or maybe a Devin Jordan, for example. But but yeah, I think that's kind of the interesting note here is, is Boganowski is still very much on the minds of this Oklahoma staff. But Reggie Powers, in my opinion, Josh, is – it's kind of a, a pressure cooker offer in a sense where like, let's say a Devin Jordan who's entertaining offers from Oklahoma State, Alabama, Texas a and but still trying to figure out his standing. If Devin Jordan doesn't figure things out, let's say Reggie Powers picks up the mm -hmm. phone, you never know. And so I think that's kind of where things are, but the, the, the biggest thing here is just patience because Reggie Powers has a lot to figure out. I think Oklahoma does too. But this is already becoming something to follow, and I think it will be an interesting storyline as the 2024 class fills out. Yeah, I mean, you, it's a good point. I mean, Powers is kind of, you know, started from scratch almost. I mean, the guy he committed to is gone, obviously, and you can feel like the buzzards. People are kind of circling that Michigan State program. But like you said, Mel Tucker and that, that staff, they, they got a lot of talent there. And obviously, a lot of Oakland yeah. fans will be eyeing by Job closely. He's certainly a, a, obviously a high prospect from Oklahoma in the previous class who committed to Michigan State. And he's one of many of those kind of really talented players that ended up out there with Sparty that now that Mel Tucker has been officially fired, you know, feeling like could we flip guys or could we get some, you know, in the transfer portal after the season or whatever. So that Michigan State program is in a uh, a bit of a uh, interesting look spot at the moment. We'll see where they go on their next hire, which could influence some of this stuff. Exactly. And that's that's one of two key points that I, I was going to make. So you hit the nail on the head. We got to figure out what they're going to tell Reggie because he did put it on the record, Josh, that Michigan State's still an option for him. It's just very fresh. Like He, he doesn't know exactly where he's going to try and, and go to, to see places. But he, he did say that Michigan State's still an option for him moving forward. So whatever hire takes place, that's that's going to be big for him. But I also feel it worth mentioning, like, if Oklahoma really does want to hit the gas pedal here, Josh, I find it at least noteworthy. If you go over Reggie's offer list, right, I think Oklahoma is probably one of the first two or three offers that stands out for you, besides 
Michigan State, and then maybe like Utah. But then I, I feel it of no. Ohio State had a crystal ball in at one point for Reggie Powers. Like it, one of our experts in 24-7 yeah. apparently felt well enough to put in a prediction favoring the Buckeyes. So if Ohio State, let's say in this hypothetical, also says just like Oklahoma, all right, well, let's go ahead and try and get this guy. It seems like the Buckeyes would step to the forefront of the race. However, I think it's it's worth mentioning as well for Oklahoma, Ohio State has already two safety takes in the cycle, and I don't know what their number's like. I'm not going to act like I know the Ohio State board off the top of my head. So sure. some to at least think about. It. When we talk about Oklahoma, Ohio State, some other schools that were in contention, like they still have some things to figure out as well because especially when it comes to the safeties, this 2024 class for a lot of programs is already kind of filled out there. For sure. So a name to keep an eye on there uh, with Powers as he kind of, like like we said, kind of resets his recruitment. And uh, Oklahoma certainly a player there. Another guy that Oklahoma has been in on that obviously things took not a great turn this week is Jordan Seaton, IMG Academy. He's the composite number one in tier offensive line in the class. He's a four-star guy, 2024 um, there at IMG, obviously, with a couple of you commits on that team already, David Stone, Jade Jackson. Um, he was supposed to visit Oklahoma this weekend for the Iowa State game. Now he's not. Colin, what are you hearing about what happened here, I guess, and is Oklahoma dead, I guess, for lack of a better term? Yeah, it, this is – this is. I don't want to say it's a crushing blow, Josh, because it's a little bit much for a guy that I personally thought Oklahoma had a lot of ground to cover with to begin with, you know sure. what I mean? But the, the thing with it, as a lot of Oklahoma fans know, is that he was going to take an official visit to Oklahoma. So they were going to be able to roll the red carpet out for him. And not only was David Stone going to join him, so essentially being that tour guy who at, at one point, I mean, helped Jaden Jackson through his mm -hmm. Oklahoma visit and several others. I mean, it, it looked like, too, on social media as of yesterday evening, that Jaden Jackson was going to make his way out with David Stone and Seaton as well. So you think in this hypothetical, if, if this official visit had been carried through, they would have show, shown Jordan Seaton a great time sure. with two teammates of his at IMG who are in his ear, and they both happened to be pledged to Oklahoma. So, like, you could have at least had a lot cooking, you know? And so why do I mention all that? Well, he's going to Tennessee instead of Oklahoma. It's not an official visit. It's a unofficial, I believe, to Knoxville. And Tennessee's going to host South Carolina. I know it's going to be ruckus out there. I mean, Rocky Top is one of the best atmospheres in college football. Mm. So, look, man, it's, it's tough because Tennessee gets to throw its punch, not in an official type of sense, but they still are going to be able to, to make a move here. When you, as Oklahoma – probably felt pretty excited about what you could accomplish going into the weekend. So, yeah, this is tough. I mean, it's it's not necessarily something where I look at it and I say, all right, this one's an over, complete, done deal. He's not coming to Oklahoma. But, like, I'm kind of leaning that direction. It just felt like this was something that had to happen for OU if you were going to make your mark in this sure. race. And Jordan Seaton has been talking about this official visit for months now. I mean, I – even in the summer, and then when I went out to go see him play against Lipscomb Academy in Nashville, he was telling everybody about how excited he was to come to Norman and take that official visit and learn more from Bill Beatonbow, right? Like, we we know, for example, beyond just some of the official visit stuff that Oklahoma does, like, Bill tends to sit down with visitors and take mm -hmm. them through game film, and it's always something that a lot of offensive linemen will rave about the experience of, and so... Yeah, this is tough. I mean, it's you're gonna have David Stone and Jaden Jackson coming still, so like it's not the end of the world. You get to recruit a few other guys on campus with those two in your corner, but the guy you wanted them really in the year of was was Jordan Seaton. And Josh, for the record, like you mentioned, number one composite interior offensive lineman, and, and I always try and contextualize the type of player we're talking about. When I went out to go see him play for IMG against Lipscomb Academy. I, I don't think I've ever seen an offensive lineman play better than he did that night. Yeah. He, this guy, this guy's a freak. I, he <laughs> he's legitimately one of my favorite offensive linemen in the cycle because I think he he honestly may have first round NFL potential. 
And for him to be able to potentially play both on the inside and a tackle because he plays the left side of the line for IMG Academy, he's an extremely talented individual, a really outgoing personality off the field, it just someone you really want in your program. And so for Oklahoma not to be able to showcase that this weekend, why he would be a good fit for them with Stone and Jackson coming to campus as well. Yeah, this is a tough one, man. And I, and I don't know what happens from here, but it just kind of feels like Oklahoma is continuing to slip in this race as schools like Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, Colorado, some really yeah. big win contenders make up ground. For sure. I mean, I get we'll keep an eye on it. Obviously, he is, you know, on the same team with with Stone, who we know can be very persuasive, and uh Jane Jackson. So we'll see. I mean, it's signing days a few months away, but obviously not. Not a great sign of that late uh, visit cancellation this week. And so uh, we'll keep an eye on it as we move along. As far as guys, oh, I also do want to mention, did you see that David Stone say he's going to wear number zero when it comes to Oklahoma? Because that yes. is sick. That S- is sick. S-T-0-N-E, right? It's yes. like the N A N I L brand. I mean, look, it, he's going to do well in Norman. That's all I'll say. Yeah. No, I, I'm more I, – I was already – all the way in on David Stone being like day one, but now that I know he's going to wear a zero, even more, even more so. Yeah, big defensive lineman wearing zero. That that plays, that plays. I'm excited for that. As far as guys, we mentioned Seton's not going to make it, but as far as guys that are going to make it uh, this weekend, should be another big recruiting weekend. Obviously, have lots of visitors in town. Uh, night game, which always makes it easier. Uh, guys play for high school football on Friday night. Just common sense, easier to get up for a night game the next day. Should be a good atmosphere. Fans are pumped up and excited about the start. Who are some guys you're keeping an eye on that will be in town uh, this weekend? Yeah, let's talk a little 2025, man. You guys know that I'm I'm really excited about the class of 2025. I think across the board in that cycle, especially down here in the South Central region, if you will, I think that the talent in the state of Oklahoma, the state of Texas, state of Louisiana, I mean, there's just really talented individuals who are also like a lot of fun to be around. And so this 2025 cycle, this is going to be another visit weekend where they kind of step into the spotlight. So mm-hmm. a couple names I'm monitoring, Josh, out of the gate, I feel like the, the guy I need to mention is Landon Rink, the defensive lineman in the greater Houston area at Site Fair. This guy, I think Texas has kind of come out and, and established itself as the early leader, but Landon has told several people, it's Texas, Oklahoma, Texas A&M all kind of fighting together, and that's likely the top three for him until he eventually makes his decision. And I kind of feel like Oklahoma might be like potentially number two at this point behind Texas. So this is an opportunity to figure out how much ground you can cover, right? I mean, he's going to be around a lot of big names. David Stone and Jaden Jackson being two really elite defensive linemen in the 24th cycle – being guys who can recruit him, yeah. probably pretty helpful for you if you're Oklahoma. And, and from there, I mean, he's going to be able to see a lot of his other peers, like a lot of OU commits in the 25 class, I believe, are going to be there. Devon Mitchell's – I mean, they're going to be guys, right, who could go after him. So I'm keeping an eye on Landon Rank. I know the Oklahoma staff is, is really excited about his potential. A lot of running backs in 2025 going to be on campus this weekend. Harlem Barry is going to be there, a guy from Louisiana. Tiger Ryden, one of my favorite running backs in the 2025 cycle at DeSoto. Shout out my guys at DeSoto, man. I don't know how they do it. They just have talent <laughs> Yeah, every constant, single yeah. year. But Tiger, DeAndre Tiger Ryden, first of all, outstanding name. Yeah, I mean, all really the fighting name. Really good. But Tiger is I, – when I went to see him in the spring game, I had just obviously moved back from Tennessee – and the DeSoto staff had told me a little bit about him. And I pulled up, and I was like, who is that? And they're like, that's Tiger. And I was like, oh, my God. I mean, he looks he looks <laughs> like a grown man already at running back uh, for DeSoto High. Really good player, and he's getting healthy. He kind of got banged up recently. So excited to see him in Norman. Then eventually I'm going to get out there to DeSoto and go and watch him. Uh, J.V. and Osborne, another one who will be on campus as far as the backfield stuff. Owen Hollenbeck, the guy we've talked about, interior mm-hmm. offensive lineman, center target for Oklahoma in 2025. I believe he'll be on campus as well. Obviously, I really like that player. And a few others here and there. 
And one guy I wanted to close with, though, we talk a lot about 2025 receiver recruiting, right? I mean, they have, what, three guys committed already at the position, if I remember correctly. Uh, Andrew Marsh is going to be on campus. I went, and go, went to go talk to him last week. Really talented wide receiver, man. I mean, he he's a really good player. I was impressed yeah. watching him at Katie Jordan. And this is, this is going to be his first visit in a really extensive list of – game day trips i gotta pull up the, the the list he gave me of games he's going to because he was like yeah oklahoma is going to be first up and then from there i'm going to hit a few other games i'm trying to get out to a couple of different matchups yeah here we go uh he's going to go to michigan ohio state lsu florida texas a&m alabama and a few other, and I'm like, all right, you're, you're going to be at some okay games. Yeah. Uh, okay. But this will be the first time he gets to go to a game day visit this fall, I believe, and Oklahoma gets that first swing. I like what they've accomplished there, but I kind of get the sense he's he's still keeping things open. And then Royal Capel is a wide receiver who will be ranked. We're waiting to get a final evaluation grade on him. He's a wide out in the San Antonio area. And I know Oklahoma is going to bring him in, check out how he's looking, go over some tape, things of that nature. But he's another one on the board for OU at 2025 at receiver who could potentially end up in the class. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of names in 2025 going to be on campus for this Iowa State game. And I, I didn't even go into all of them. I mean, it's hard to in the limited amount of time we have. But sure. those are just a few names I'm keeping an eye on and, I find it interesting just some of the the nuanced storylines, whether that be the running backs on campus or maybe a couple wide receivers who will be there as well as that class starts to get those positions really sort of finalized at this point. Yeah, March and Capel are both guys that we saw at uh, Brent Venables football camp back in June. And uh, both guys were, as you'd expect, standouts. Uh, I believe I, I was doing – I did some VIP kind of standout guys from both of those camps and – I included both of them. They both, I mean, they both stand out, you know, as guys who, and Capel got no you offer right after, got the day of uh, in Norman there after, you know, competing at the, the Brent Venables camp. So makes sense. Those are two talented guys. Uh, see them in perks. Obviously, just seven on seven. They're not wearing pads, they're just running drills and stuff, but they, they, they stood out for good reason. So c- cool to see those guys, uh, you know, from camp making it to campus, you know, uh, during the season. So, yeah. A lot of names to keep an eye on, and that's why you become a VIP subscriber. Colin will update everybody on kind of what he's hearing coming out of that. But uh, another loaded list, uh, as you'd expect. Yeah, not, not not the worst weekend in the world before you go play in the OU Texas game. Mm. Usually that's also kind of a loaded recruiting weekend, too. So right. a lot of eyes going to be on Oklahoma from the recruiting trail over the next couple of weeks. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, and I do want to also mention here as we uh, shift over to the Iowa State game, uh, we're not just ignoring Terry Bussey. He's committing today. Um, he's committing later this afternoon. We're recording this right now. It's about noon on Thursday. So, obviously, most by, by the time that the lion's share of people watch or listen to the show, you'll have made a decision one way or another. So, I recommend you go back to last Thursday show if you didn't catch it. We talked a lot about Bussey where things stood then. Um, if you want to get a little little taste of what Colin was feeling at that time. And uh, obviously, keep up with the site, Oklahoma.247sports.com, Sooners Illustrated, to get to know uh, what happens there with Bussy and keep up with Colin. And uh, as he makes his decision later this afternoon, five-star athlete, uh, obviously, is going to be a, a highly uh, coveted one, one that a lot of people will be paying attention to here in a few hours or so. Um, so not just ignoring him by any means. And uh, we'll talk about that a little further probably on Monday, one way or another with how that goes. So not ignoring them, but we'll, we'll get that on Monday. Just want to make sure we get that. Get that yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's enough chaos to talk about between Powers, <laughs> Seton, Bussy, this visit weekend. <laughs> we'll, we'll save some more for later. Absolutely. Absolutely. So before I let you go, Colin, do want to get your thoughts on the game this weekend. Of course, as always, Oklahoma, Iowa State. Obviously, Sooners off to a great start. 4-0. Defense has looked amazing. Offense has been a little... You know, it's had moments of, of brilliance and some some stretches of kind of not really finding their footing. I would say it's got a pretty rock solid defense, both top fifty in pass and run defense. 
or some things you're watching for this weekend as Oklahoma tries to get to 5-0. and oh. and, and really just, we talked about on Monday with Tom and James, but just avoid what feels like a classic textbook look-ahead spot, obviously with Texas coming up the next weekend. Oklahoma's a big favorite here, 20-point favorite, as I last checked just before we started recording this. So sooner should be okay here, but what are, what are some things you're watching for this weekend as Oklahoma tries to just get the job done and get to that Texas game next weekend? Yeah, man. So we first off, we have behind enemy lines up at Sooners Illustrated. You guys, if you're not subscribed, go check it out. It's obviously where we bring in writers from across the 24-7 Sports Network who cover OU's opponents on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they come in and share with OU fans what to expect, what they're keeping an eye on. And so our newest Iowa State writer just hopped on the site and gave the, the goods to OU fans. Go check that out. But for me, reading what he wrote and, and kind of applying it to an Oklahoma perspective. I, I think this game, Josh, honestly, it it should play right into Oklahoma's hands. And what do I mean by that? Like, if you look at it this way, what does Iowa State want to do? They want to run the football, and they want to prevent you from explosive plays. Well, they don't have their starting quarterback or starting running back due to the gambling probe, right? Right. They haven't been very good, honestly, running the football out of the gate. They've been okay. They haven't been elite. And they've got two guys who are still trying to settle it in back there at the backfield spot. And then on the flip side of this, it's like, yeah, Iowa State, we know John Haycock's one of the best defensive coordinators in America. And he's basically, if you think about it, kind of revolutionized the way you play defense in the Big 12. Mm -hmm. But Iowa State's still been beatable, to say the least. And I remember, what was it, last year when this game was played, Josh, Eric Gray went over 100, and even though you didn't throw the ball very well in that game, I believe they still came out and won. So They did. It was kind of kind of similar feeling game as the, the game we just watched, the Cincinnati game, where defense did its thing. Offense never got it really going, but did enough to win on the road. Good road atmosphere. It's also when they had the trick play where, you know, uh, Zach Schmidt ran the – Ran the touchdown in, which was fun. Haven't seen anything like that yet this year. But I would hope that it doesn't come to that for Oklahoma to turn <laughs> around. Right? Let's go ahead and just be in a position where you're. Scoring. I would say it has been good at Norman. They have, and and that's the thing too. They they've they've been able to find ways to make it competitive when they're playing at OU. But yeah, I, our, our CBS research team sent us a notes packet, Josh. Apparently. Oklahoma has the best winning percentage over Iowa State among any Power 5 team over a Power 5 opponent with a minimum of 50 games played. Like I, I, yeah, 79-7, I, I believe. Yeah, it's, it's something like that, and it's bad. I mean, I was reading it, and apparently Iowa State has three wins since 1961 in this matchup. So, yeah, I, that, it doesn't feel great. But again, like this game should play into Oklahoma's favor. And that's why for me, like the, the whole thing in this game is can Oklahoma run the football, right? I mean, if they run the ball, they get things figured out on the ground. That then says, okay, if Iowa State wants to run the ball, OU's really good in run defense. They put it in the hands of their quarterback, who's a young guy. He's played well. But he's got to go on the road and face this OU defense that's been elite, especially in the passing game as far as turnovers, right? I mean, what are they, tops in the conference minimum and in interceptions right now? So there's a lot of things that Iowa State wants to do that play in Oklahoma's mm -hmm. favor. I just feel like, man, if OU doesn't come out and get things figured out from a run game perspective, then we're in for another close game. So that's, that's yeah. what I'm – watching as Iowa State comes to town for potentially the final time. For uh, clarification purposes, it is 79-7, but 79-7 and two. They the two ties. Although, weirdly, you know, I mean, it's only seven wins, obviously not very many at all, but four of them have come in Norman, which is kind of the funny thing with Iowa State. They've actually been better in this series in Norman. Still awful. Still heavy, heavy Oklahoma but actually they've been a little better. And especially recently under Matt Campbell, they've pretty much always played Oklahoma tough. Even some teams that really didn't have any business playing them tough. You think of 2019, where Iowa State went to Norman and very nearly beat the Jalen Hurts uh, OU team. So Matt Campbell's just always kind of had a way 
uh, to at least make muck it up and make it interesting. So we'll see what happens this weekend. Did you have a score, score prediction? You're still 4-0. I actually, I need to, and I'll bring it up with James and Tom too. I, I misspoke on Monday's show. I thought that the game closed at 14. So I thought it was a push, but it actually closed at 13. So Oklahoma did cover again. So they remain 4-0 against the spread, which means that we're all 4-0 picking against the spread because we all thought Oklahoma would uh, would cover, except for Tom. He's 3-1. What do you got this weekend? Oklahoma, Iowa State, what's your score prediction? I'm going to go <laughs> – oh, I hate this. I'm going to go – Over under 40 and a half. If you're curious, what is it? 48 and a half. I want to say Oklahoma covers, but I'm trying to do the math off the top of my head. So I'm well, <laughs> I'll say this. I'm gonna go 30, I'm gonna go 35, 13. 35, 13. So sooners cover. I think cover I think off. my thing is, man, like I if you don't beat this Iowa State team. We gotta have some talks, you know. Yeah. Like, this is this is a team that has lost players for pretty unfortunate reasons, to say <laughs> the least. I mean, Matt Campbell is not in a great spot. He's attacking fans. They 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 don't do well what they want to do. I mean, I just again, I feel like what Iowa State is plays in Oklahoma's favor. To me, the only way that this ends up being a sweated out type of game again is if Oklahoma can't run the football. And yeah, like we've seen that, but at some point you got to get figured out. So maybe my hope is that they do get things going in the ground game this weekend. And if that is the case, I'm not going to pretend to know an exact final score I have, but I feel like this should be a game where they cover again. Yeah, for sure. And, and I agree. And I'll get into that with Tom and James in a moment. But Oklahoma should be fine here, um, you would you would think. Iowa State does not have a lot of firepower. Don't let what they did to Oklahoma State, putting up 34, uh, deceive you. There's a team that scored 70 against Ohio the week before. So if Oklahoma defense continues to do what it did, on the most simplistic level, you just beat a better team on the road by two scores last weekend. So. And, uh, what, hey, speaking of all this, whatever the Bedlam line is, go ahead and take me as a cover. I don't care what it is. Like, <laughs> if we want to talk about Iowa State's win over Oklahoma State, I don't even care what Bedlam's going to look like. Give me the cover already. It might. Uh, it could be an ugly, an ugly scene in Stillwater. It could be, and I, I don't even mean just the game, but like the crowd. It, it's going to be. Uh, it could be. It is Bedlam. It is Bedlam. But uh, we'll we'll figure that out when we get a little closer, I guess. But. Yeah, not pretty in Stillwater either. The Big 12 in general, just kind of a little, little bit in shambles at the moment. All right, CK, appreciate you. Uh, we'll catch back up with you next week. We'll be getting ready for the Texas game next week. Oh, boy. Uh, we'll be leaning on you heavy for that. Obviously, lots of guys you kept up with on the recruiting side on that team. So, going to be a fun one, uh, obviously, always is. But if OU and Texas can just get through this weekend, both with home games that they should win, Texas got a tougher game certainly than OU does, but – still should win, we're set up for an absolute doozy next weekend and talking about, you know, I mean, the eyes of a college football world will be on Dallas next weekend. So looking forward to previewing that one and talking about some more recruiting with you then. Can't wait, man. As always, though, another week of football. So y'all go enjoy it and be safe. And let's see what the Sooners do against Iowa State. 100%. All right, man. Talk to you next week. We'll go ahead and loop in Tom Green and James D. Jackson now for our full Oklahoma-Iowa State breakdown and preview. All right, we now welcome in Tom Green, James D. Jackson. Gentlemen, how are we feeling? Back at home this weekend. Excited to be back in Norman. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's nice to, <laughs> not, not, nice to be back at home after a couple of weeks on the road. Uh, actually get to enjoy a little bit of our Saturdays with the late late kick. So sure. that'll be nice. Yeah, as Tom said, thumb, I mean, thumbs up from Tom for those that are, are listening on the podcast. It did yeah, an awkward saying. silence there. That's what Tom was doing. We do yeah, need YouTube viewership, but it is a podcast at the end of the day. Podcasting is a visual <laughs> medium. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Looking forward to it. Just talking about the game a little bit with Colin this weekend. Uh, it was a bit of a catch-your-breath weekend, I think, for everybody. But – Team obviously needs to not look ahead. Texas is on the horizon. We're all excited for that. But we have Iowa State coming up first on Saturday. This is a night game, like Tom said, 6 p.m. kick. 
It's going to be on FS1. So uh, get your affairs in order there. This is, as Kyle and I were just talking about uh, before the little break there, the most lopsided Power 5 versus Power 5 series in college football, which is an amazing stat that uh, Colin dropped. 79-72. There is nobody that has a better record as a Power 5 team against another Power 5 team. This is as lopsided as it gets in college football. But in recent history, this has been a competitive series. Iowa State has played Oklahoma tough. They've played, played specifically in Norman very mm-hmm. tough. Some teams that really had no business coming in and pushing OU have done it the last several years. Uh, 2021, 2019, close games in Norman, even though Oklahoma had clearly a better team. So Matt Campbell always kind of gets his guys up to play OU. This Iowa State team is not very good, does not have a lot of offensive firepower, scored seven against Ohio a couple weeks ago and lost. Did put up a good number against Oklahoma State, but Oklahoma State is pretty clearly very bad. So what are some thoughts on this game? Um, obviously, Oklahoma is a big favorite, 20 points even, as it stands right now recording on Thursday. Sooners should be okay here. We talked about that a little bit on Monday. Some thoughts, I guess, in general on this game in terms of is there anything that scares you for Oklahoma going into this weekend against the Cyclones? I guess I would say team that's just simply is just not, you know, if they get to bowl eligibility, they'd probably be a very good season. Uh, to put it, uh, you know, in that kind of terms for Iowa State this year. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything that's too concerning for Oklahoma. I think I think this is going to be a game where Oklahoma is going to have to try to establish the run a little bit more just because Iowa State at least mm-hmm. has a pretty solid pass defense. You know, they're top five nationally in uh, pass efficiency defense, um, giving up just four touchdown passes, five interceptions, uh seventh best yards per attempt allowed in the country at 5.2 Oklahoma's, you know, averaging double that through its first four games, 10.4. Yeah. I think they're Um, like top 25 in yards per game too. Yeah. 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 Their pass defense is is pretty solid. So, um, you know, I think this is just going to be one of those games where we might not see Oklahoma just try to, you know, take the top off the defense. Like we've seen in some of these weeks, it might be a little bit more of those dink and dunks that we've seen, uh, from Dylan Gabriel like last week and uh, even against SMU to an extent. Um, but, yeah, they're going to have to solve that running game at some point because we all know that's that's kind of been the big question mark on this offense, which seems really weird, um, not something mm-hmm. we really expected, you know, two months ago when we were getting ready to start fall camp. Uh, but that running game has just kind of been irregular. The rotation's been weird. Guys haven't been able to get into a rhythm. Offensive line hasn't done a great job of opening up lanes, but they might need to do yeah. that to kind of get things rolling this weekend against Iowa State. Yeah, I think it'll be it'll be strength versus strength pretty much because Oklahoma's passing game is so good, and I think Iowa State, as Josh said, they they're pretty good on the on the on the passing side when they're, they're defensively wise. So you might see like one of those weird games where like the weakness of a team kind of comes out and, you know, and shines in this one, which would be Oklahoma's run game or Iowa State's run defense. That might decide this game uh, will make it close or not close because I think OU is going to win this uh, regardless of what happens out there. But that, that'll, that'll you know, make things change for OU or Iowa State, given what they've done. And we talked about, you know, this running back rotation. We, we, we talked about it. We asked Brent Venables about it on Tuesday. And he was like, yeah, you know what? It is kind of difficult for guys to get in a rhythm when, you know, it changes up every week. Mm-hmm. But Right now, it's just no guy has put himself above everybody else uh, with with the guys that are dealing with injury, with guys that are just you know trying to get in the get in there, get their reps in. There's just there hasn't been a standout guy just yet that they've seen in practice. And so, I mean, that's that's where OU is right now because, like we said, Marcus Major was running back last week. This week, it could be somebody totally different based on how they do in practice. So that that that'll be that'll be something to see. It's like every week we got to be like, all right, who, who's going to be the leading rusher? Who's going to be the premier back? And once again, it's going to be that situation for OU. Yeah, I mean, their run defense is good, too. Not as good as pass. So they are, like, top 50, I think, in yeah. rush yards per game, too. I mean, they this is just a good defensive team. Um, you know, Brent Venables talked about that on Tuesday. Obviously, Heacock, the defensive coordinator there. Uh, Colin brought that up just a little bit a minute ago. One of the better defensive coordinators in the country. Very highly respected uh, around the country. This is a game. I mean, if you're talking about the path to the upset for how Iowa State could pull this off, um, it would be, yeah, that. Oklahoma continues to not be able to run the ball. They're forced to throw it. And unlike what they've largely been able to do for the first four games, they don't, they're, you know, they're not able to just get guys open 
all over the place because Iowa State has got a good secondary and they have a good pass rush and they're they've done a really good job, you know, in the pass defense as well. So there is the anatomy of it there for Oklahoma. They're going to need to figure out how to run the ball. Like you said, the rotations have been weird, um, mainly because there there haven't been rotations. They obviously last week whole game no Barnes no Sawchuk again. I, I don't I don't know why that keeps happening. So. Obviously, Brett Venables talked about on Tuesday. He said, like James referenced, nobody has, you know, asserted themselves or however he put it, like Eric Gray did. Established. Nobody's established themselves like Eric Gray did last year. Um, and DeMarco Murray determines the rotations based off the week of practice. And so I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what goes into that or why Barnes specifically Barnes. And that's been the sticking point for me because he was the number two guy last year. I mean, we've seen him do it. It's not like God and Sawchuk, we all know is talented, but he's more of like a, a projecting. He's like a concept more than what we've actually seen because he just doesn't have that many carries. Javante Barnes was a legit number two to Eric Gray all year last year. And we're just not seeing him play, you know, th this season so far. So, yeah, I mean, I would say he's got a good run defense too. And if Oklahoma doesn't run the ball and they set up on third and eight, third and nines, that's not going to be as easy to overcome as it was against you know, some of these other teams that Oklahoma just played. So that is just going to be a challenge for Oklahoma's offense. This will be the biggest test so far. And obviously, like we've talked about many times, they haven't consistently moved the ball and scored against the better teams they've played. So it's a little bit, you know, Oklahoma's a good favor here. They should win, but there, it's, there's some dicey elements to this uh, on Saturday. Yeah, it's like Brent Venables said the other day. I mean, they're going to face different – types of challenges each week obviously mm -hmm. last week was the best defensive line they faced this season this week it'll be the best pass defense they faced to date um and they're just gonna have to find different ways to win these games and exploit certain matchups to their advantage and they've been able to do that so far um like you mentioned the offense has struggled to finish off some drives but they've been able to move the ball pretty well it's just last week they couldn't execute in the red zone uh which was a big issue there, um, you know, settling for two field goals and then losing a fumble down at the 10-yard line. Uh, they're going to need to be able to punch the ball in once they get into that that kind of field position there. For sure, for sure. As far as uh, offense or defensively, I should say, for Oklahoma against Iowa State's offense, like I said, not great. They don't have a lot of firepower. The one stat that kind of blew me away when, when looking into Iowa State a little bit um, you know, did you guys stumble upon how many sacks Iowa State has allowed this season? Yeah, Uno. one sack. Okay, I mean, uh, OU's pretty close to that too. Yeah, OU's pretty close to that too. So, counterpoint, they've only given up one sack, but they've given up a lot of pressures. Like Rocco yeah. Beck, Rocco Beck has been Rocco facing Beck through the ball. He's yeah. been facing a lot of pressure this season. Um, you know, according to Pro Football Focus, they've given up 35 pressures in four games. By comparison, Oklahoma's only given up 24. Um, Iowa State has one of the worst pass blocking grades in the country um, <laughs> at 49.6. There's only three Power Five teams that are worse than them right now, and that's Illinois, Indiana, and Stanford. So while while the the sacks aren't a lot, teams are getting pressure against Iowa sure. State. This sure. is not a great offensive line. And, you know, I think that's a matchup that, again, we talked about Oklahoma's going to have to take advantage of some matchups that are favorable to them. Up front defensively, they're going to have a favorable matchup trying to get after the quarterback here. Now, Rocco Beck's done a good job of getting the ball away pretty quickly yeah. in those situations. But, again, he's a freshman. He's doesn't have a lot of experience. He, he's been playing pretty well for a freshman, all things considered. You know, he's yeah. got like close to 900 passing yards – seven touchdowns, three interceptions, completing 65% of his passes. He's been pretty solid. But this is a real opportunity for Oklahoma's defense to get home and really kind of rattle him because, um, you know, he's going to be playing in a very tough road environment under the lights against the defense that's been playing lights out right now. So this is, this is a matchup that Oklahoma absolutely has to take advantage of and come out on top. Yeah, OU, I think OU should get at least two sacks in this game based on what I saw. I watched the uh, Iowa State Oklahoma State game, went back and watched it. Just just see how, you know, Rocco handled himself. I think OU, with what we've seen from that defense so far, should be able to get two sacks uh, based on the offensive line. When, when they did get pressure at Oklahoma State, it was Rocco kind of throwing it away or, you know, 
trying to hit a guy on the outside. It was it was one of those type of situations. And the two touchdowns that I mean, one of the two touchdowns, it looked like like Noah just got just nobody even paid attention to him, which is their best receiver. So that was that was a weird situation for Oklahoma State. I don't think Oklahoma is going to make that same mistake because Brent Venables talked a lot about Noah, so I, I'm pretty sure they're going to key in on that guy and and not let him be the one that beats him if that if that comes down to it. So, I mean, just I think OU should be, be able to get a a good little press, a good good amount of pressure on him here in this game, and yeah. that, that'll make a difference for a freshman. Yeah, no, I mean Rocco Beck has been pretty good, uh, like Tom said. Mm -hmm. Just start for him, just this freshman. I'm excited to see him for the first time in person. Uh, obviously, we're busy on Saturdays. I don't get to see a lot of the other games. So I haven't seen a lot of him other than just highlights. So I'm excited to see him play in person because, like Tom said, 65% of his passes, about 900 yards for the first four games, seven tutties, three picks, only a sack one time. So obviously, he's getting rid of the ball, sensing pressure, things like that. Good start for him. Um, a few different receivers. He's kind of spreading the ball around. He's not just feeding one guy. They – They've had a nice start uh, from the receiving core at this point. Run game, though, they can't run the ball. Uh, their rushing statistics are bad. 2.9 yards per carry as a team. And their leading rusher, Cartavius Norton, 126 yards. We're four games in. That, that's, that's a good game. And we're four games in, 126 yards is their leading rusher right now. So they can't run the ball. So if Oklahoma take, you know, if Oklahoma just doesn't let, you know, Bex beat them essentially, this should be an opportunity to keep Iowa State to another low point total. We, we talked about it on Monday's show, and James Long did the wrap. They're averaging eight and a half points per game allowed right now. Um, and we joke, you know, that that's going to be a good number. You're going to win a lot of games with that. I don't think that average is going to go much up this weekend. I don't think, uh, you know, Iowa State just doesn't have a lot to scare you offensively. I, I have to assume you guys are in, on the same page there, or what do you guys think about, you know, just – if you're Oklahoma's defense, you got to be looking your chops, thinking this is going to be another chance for us to really kind of dominate again. And from, yeah, from what I, I from what I saw, Norton, the one of the running backs, got hurt in the the first quarter against Oklahoma State early in the early in the game, hurt his shoulder. So, I mean, that running game it just just took another hit, you know, as as OU comes in. So, I mean, mm. I don't see how, I don't see how how it'll get much better, especially <clears> with the way that OU defense has been playing this year. Yeah, I mean, Iowa State's 110th nationally in scoring offense right now. They're averaging just 21 points a game against FBS opponents. It drops down to 18 points a game. It hasn't been great. They're 2-2 two and two on the year. I just I don't see them having enough firepower to really threaten Oklahoma's defense. Um, and again, like going, going back to that, that pass blocking and Oklahoma's pass rush, again, Oklahoma hasn't gotten a lot of sacks. But last week they had 33 pressures. Yeah, I mean, they were getting after him, even if they weren't finishing off some of those plays. And it was showing. I mean, he obviously didn't put up great numbers. The defense had a, probably its best all-around performance of the season when you take into context of, hey, it's a conference game, it's on the road, um, all that. But, you know, I, I expect this defense to just keep chugging along like it's been so far. Um, you know, can't say enough about kind of the turnaround that they've had on that side of the ball. It's just been really impressive. They've really shown their depth. You know, they had 30 guys play last week. Um, they've played like 40-something guys already this season. Snap distributions are a little bit more even. I mean, you still have guys like Danny Stutzman and Woody Washington playing a lot of snaps. But the defense as a whole is playing fewer snaps through four games. I think they've played 33 fewer snaps. You know, part of that is just better third mm -hmm. down defense. Part of it is games are getting a little shortened because of those new clock rules. But the defense has done a good job of staying fresh late in games. And we saw it last week. You know, they closed that game with three straight fourth down stops. That defense doesn't do that a year ago. They fade late in games. This defense has seemingly yeah. gotten stronger later in games. And, you know, I think that's something that's just going to continue to carry over and kind of build up for them. No, you're correct. You're spot on, Tom. I mean, last year's team, obviously, we talked about the stat has been said. 10,000 times, 0-5 oh, in one score games. A big part of that is not being able to get stops at all late in the games. And just fatigue, fatigue being a huge part of that. So far this year, every single game, all four weeks, Oklahoma has ended the game ascending. Like, they, they've they ended strong every game. They've ended, I think, I, I, I saw the stat earlier this week. I should have uh, kept it for, for the show here. But it's like they've ended on at least like a 10 or plus point unanswered run like to end the game if that makes mm -hmm. sense the way I'm, I'm worried that i'm kind of butchering that but you get what i'm saying right they've they finished this game on saturday was 10-6 they won 20-6 you know the tulsa game was 
whatever it was to 17 they ended. You know what I mean? Like they finished strong. They've dominated the fourth quarter in every game so far. They've dominated the games, period, but especially the fourth quarter. And a big part of that is, like you're saying, Tom, getting more guys rotated in. I'm very excited to see Rondell Bothroy, too, because he's this guy who we came in, who we talked about in camp, was going to kind of be the sack guy for this team. Finally broke through and got his first sack. That sick one hand just threw Emory Jones to the ground with literally a mitt while he's being held. Yeah, just grabbed and him. And it got, it got called back. Kendall Dobie lined up in the neutral zone. But he, he talked about this week that he still, you know, even though it got called back, doesn't stay away from the play. He still gets confidence from that. He still feels like it's coming around. He's like, it felt good to get home, and though it got called back. He's like, we still got the stop, so I've forgiven Kendall, you know, things like that. Um, and so I'm excited to see him. I'm, I'm keeping a very, especially a close eye on him. Um, getting home maybe once uh, or even twice, you know, like James said, uh, this weekend to get home. Because that, that's the one thing, that pass rush has felt more and more disruptive every single week. And so you kind of want to see that continue to build. Because that's what they're going to have to do against Texas. Plain and simple. They're going to have to get to yours and uh, you know, get them behind the sticks if they're going to beat them next weekend. So this is your last chance to tune that up before then. Before then. So yeah. certainly keep a close eye on that this weekend. And that's why the run game is so important, Josh. It's like the last week to get it tuned up before Texas. Like you got to get yeah, that situated. True. You want to get somebody in that rhythm we're talking about? Yeah. yeah this, I mean, so, and so far, I mean, I think Tommy Walker is the best guy we've seen, you know, when he's he's been the feature back. So far, he's been the best guy. Sure. So maybe he'll go out there. But like we said, we still haven't seen Gavin Sawchuck get us, you know, a couple series as the feature back. You know, he's still coming back from the hamstring injury. So the run game is a big issue. The pass, the pass rush is a big issue. Let's figure it. Ta- it's time to figure it out this week. Yeah, and and the, going back to the pass rush, I mean, we've seen some of these guys step up in kind of situational roles. Like Mark Stripling's had some good moments. Mm-hmm. Uh, PJ Adeboare, I mean, yeah, PJ. His, 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 I know they they kind of you know took it slow with him in a way. Like you know, he's a five star coming in. Yes, you know, some people are like, oh, he needs to be on the field immediately. But you know, he's still kind of a developmental prospect. But his snap counts the last two weeks have pretty much doubled. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the first two games, I think he was playing like 11 snaps a game. The last two, he's up to like 22. Um, I think Brent Venable said on his coach's show Monday that on the, you know, the flight back from Cincinnati, he was watching film and went over to Miguel Chavez and was like, hey, this guy needs to play more snaps. Like just watching the film, what, what he's been able right. to do. I mean, I think we're seeing him gain some confidence and kind of come into his own there too. And you, you're seeing that natural ability. Um, and again, the more guys that they can rotate and keep fresh and get, you know, consistent effective pass rush is just going to help bolster this defense because they're off to a phenomenal start right now and just to plug a story based on what tom just said i wrote a story on pj and print and brent venables their their first visit home visit to see pj and and what that meant to to brent venables what he saw out of the parents and and pj so i mean check that out it's free on the website so you can click on it even if you're not subscribed just yet even though you should but go ahead and look at that and it's good read it's good read I'd be interested to, you know, obviously we don't know exactly where Jaron Canning stands right now. From what I've been hearing, it sounds like if he really needed to go, he could. Mm-hmm. Might be a game time decision how he's feeling. We would expect him certainly back for the Texas game this week. We'll see. But if let's assume he doesn't go, um, how they handle that? Is it Kip Lewis? Is it Cody McKenzie? On the depth chart on week one, it was Connor Near listed behind him. We haven't seen that guy. Has he been even – I mean, what is his snap? Tom, you do the snap counts. Near, I think what, he, got in against, counts? he got in against Arkansas State, I think. He, he's he's played in some games. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Arkansas State game, he played four snaps. Um, you know, most that of tells you, yeah. Um, so, I, I don't have the number right in front of me, but it's not a lot. He has not been a factor in the rotation. No, not at all. They, so they've if, been trusting Kip Lewis and Kobe McKenzie mm-hmm. more so. Um, yeah, and just to kind of answer your question, I would expect it to be Kip Lewis. Yeah, me too. That That's nod. what I was gonna say. But uh, you know, I would expect Kobe McKenzie to see a increased role than he has because um, he's looked good in some spots. But they they might need some more out of him this week if Jaron Kanick indeed cannot or you know is is held out because of you know the injury that he sustained last week. Mm. Chest injury, yes. Brent Venables classified it. So yeah, no, that's gonna be something that. Uh, you know, keep an eye on. What about last thing I want to, to ask you guys about going back to offense? So, obviously, Angel Anthony's been great. Um, we've talked about that a lot of times. He's been the best offensive player on the team uh, so far. I guess either him or Gabriel, if you want to do that, that kind of conversation. But 
well, let's assume Iowa State is able to take Anthony away. They, they've, they've done really well in the past defense so far. We talked about that just a minute ago. Who are you looking for? I mean, Farouk's had his moments. He was great against Tulsa. He's had flashes against Cincinnati and against SMU, but not big games by any means. Um, Nick Anderson obviously has been great. I'm going, I'm going Nick Bruce Anderson is that you know that guy. He's right there. He's a reliable force. Who who do you turn to if Anthony? Because eventually, at some point, Angel Anthony won't go crazy. <laughs> you have to. He's been so good, but eventually, he's going to have a game where he's not going for over 100 yards. Who's next? I would say Farouk. Um, but for you guys, where where does your attention go if Anthony is kept under wraps a little bit more? I'm going oh, Nick yeah. Anderson. Yeah, I'm going Nick Anderson, man. As a guy that can you know make a play, be a playmaker, and be things good. like that. That that's the guy I'm going with. Like Jaleel Farouk can do it. Yes, um, I think Drake Stoops is more like a possession receiver. So he's just like he's a guy that you know can catch the ball in, in the moment you really need it. But he's not making a lot of guys just just miss and get into the end zone. We haven't seen that yet from this year, I should say. I think Drake Soups is the same. Drake Soups is like a – he's the best punt returner on the team, obviously. He can do that in the punt return, uh, and he's good for jet sweeps. But overall, I think him and Drake Stoops are kind of like the similar play style of a possession receiver, somebody you get across the middle of the field and just get just pick up some yards. But Nick Anderson's the guy. I mean, from what we've seen so far, when he's healthy and he's been out there, he's a problem for defenses. That he's a problem, right? And I don't know, maybe Andrew Anthony's making that, you know, give him more room to have that freedom to do that. But mm. he'd be the next guy, I would think. Yeah, I mean, Nick Anderson has been great. Like, I don't want to take anything away from what he's done. You know, four touchdowns the last two games. But if they're taking away Andrew Anthony, I'm with Josh here. I think Jaleel Farouk is the guy that sure. you kind of need to – Which isn't a He makes this offense go yeah. because he's a guy that you can get involved in multiple ways. Just get him in the open field and let him be shifty. Um, he can make guys miss if the run game is maybe having some struggle going. Like he's a guy that you can get him the ball either. You know, we haven't seen it yet, really, but a wildcat situation or on a jet sweep, something like that. Well, they've handed it off to him. They've handed it yeah. off. To Jaleel yeah, yeah. They they just need to do a better job of getting the ball in his hands. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, I mentioned this with Josh on the last show, but you know, he had two catches on nine targets last week. Like that, that's not going to cut it out. Um, you know, he he's yeah. he needs to be more efficient in his touches. You know, whether that's you know, obviously, you know, one of those was an overthrow by Dylan Gabriel on that deep ball. So that that's not so much on Jaleel as it is on Dylan for that one. But they just need to find the way to get him the ball effectively and let him make some things happen. Um, especially if Iowa State is able to kind of corral Andrew Anthony. It doesn't seem like the timing with was- Dylan and Farouk is all the way there just yet. And I think that's why it's, his numbers are not as impressive as we thought. Because we thought coming in, he would be the, the leading receiver. Uh, everybody except for Tom. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give you props, Tom. But, yeah, we, we thought he was based on what Emmett Jones was telling right. us about Jaleel Farouk. He needs the ball on first and second down, you know, things like that. Maybe the time is just not there yet because we've seen him miss a couple of throws. And that's kind of made things, you know, a little bit difficult for Jaleel. That's why. Yeah, I'll say, too, like, I do think that they're not quite in in sync, but also the rest of that receiving room has been a lot better than I think we all expected. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, they 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 haven't yeah. had to go to Jalil as often as you know we may have thought going into the season. Um, I don't think anybody really thought that you know Nick Anderson would have the kind of start that he's had. That Jaden Gibson would make some of these tough catches that we've seen through these first four weeks. Mm-hmm. So credit to them, credit to Emma Jones on what he's been able to do with that receiving room. But I, I agree, they need to do something to get Jaleel a little bit more oh. involved in this offense. Drake Stoops told me Jaden Gibson was going to be a, a a good receiver in the jump ball situation. So I'm glad he said that because I wrote that earlier in the year. So it wasn't yeah. too surprising to see that because I, I trust Drake Stoops' analysis. Coach is telling. Yeah, I mean, Gibson's definitely had the, the best catches. Mm-hmm. Um He's put him more near the guy. He's come down with it this year, it seems like, um, to this point. So, yeah, it's going to be fun to see how that shakes out. You know, this offense has been – it's been, you know, moments where it looks like everything's fine and other moments where it looks kind of kind of ugly. And uh, Iowa State's got a good defense. So, we'll see how that looks this weekend. Um, like we've said, last chance to button anything up before you play Texas next weekend. So, we're going to need to be at your best. So, it's going to be a fun one this weekend. Final thoughts on this game and your pick. Uh, Colin for – your information, 35-13, Oklahoma. 
So he has Oklahoma covering. 13, right? I have the spread at 20 even right mm-hmm. now, uh, 20.0. Did want to mention, I, I mentioned it with Colin a minute ago. Um, it was pointed out uh, in the comments on Monday. It actually closed at 13, so I misspoke on Monday. They did cover. I thought it pushed because I thought it closed at 14. That's where it was, but it went to 13 on game day. So Oklahoma did actually cover. So they're 4-0 against the spread, which means that James, myself, and Colin are 4-0 against the spread. Tom's 3-1 and on a heater. Um, so uh, for the last couple of weeks, yeah. What shout out to one of our had? shout out to one of our commenters on the YouTube page. For yeah, appreciate letting you. us know. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, what do we think this weekend? What's the final score? Thoughts on this game? How does it go? Does Oklahoma win? Do they cover? Good stuff like that. Yeah, I'll go first. I mean, sure. I, my score prediction: I'll go Oklahoma thirty-eight, Iowa State ten. I think that Oklahoma covers this one fairly easily. Um, I, I just don't think that Iowa State offensively has enough to really threaten this, especially the way Oklahoma's been playing on defense right now. I think we're going to see a little bit more efficiency from Oklahoma's offense compared to last week. They've been able to move the ball pretty well. It's just a matter of finishing off some of those drives. Um, and I expect them to be able to do that and roll into Red River at 5-0. and I'm going to go 35-7. Oklahoma uh, to take the take the win and the spread. I don't think Iowa State is going to try to kick too many field goals. I feel like this is a fourth down, you're going for it on fourth down type of game throughout, you know, throughout most of it for Iowa State. Just because you're the underdogs, you're on the road. I think they'll go for it on fourth down a lot. They won't kick many field goals. So I'm, I'm giving them one touchdown. Yeah, I'm going to go 27 6 Oklahoma. Last week I was the high man and it burned me. I was for 20 points. So then this time I'm going to be the low man, which means I'll probably go for like 50. Um. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I'm. I'm. I'm a little shaky with the offense right now. Uh, my confidence is is not that high at the moment. And uh, like we talked about, Iowa State can defend the run. And so if Oklahoma is having to sit back and try to bomb it on Iowa State, they they can defend the pass too. So, um, I mean, I think Oklahoma's gonna be fine in this game. I have them covering by a hair, not by a lot, but I do have them covering. Um, they'll be fine. I don't think they're ever going to really feel like they're going to lose this game. I have a hard time seeing Iowa State get in the end zone. I, I Their offense, to, you know, is – I don't know. We'll see. Maybe I'll, I'll feel foolish. But it, I think Oklahoma's defense is going to continue to be really good. And that points per game is going to go down from 8.5. Um, 27-6. So we all got Oklahoma winning and covering. And uh, it's been pretty – Pretty uniform on the picks. I think we may have some more variation next week. Uh, Oklahoma Tech. We yeah. may be a little more all over the place. I'm still – if you haven't picked that OU Texas game today, like it really – this weekend is going to heavily influence my, my oh, pick. Yeah. Yeah. What Texas does against Kansas at home and then what Oklahoma does this weekend against a better defense, Iowa State. Like it, we'll see how things shake out. It's going to be fun. But both teams got to just get through this weekend. Just get through it. Get to being 5-0 and and give us – what will be an all-time spectacle next week, and it always is. But when the game, when the teams are both in the top, you know, whatever Oklahoma would be at that point, 12, 10, it's, uh, it has a little extra juice. So I wonder how OU fans feel it. about this. Like, do you want Texas to get beat by Kansas just because you hate Texas so much? Or do you want them to win? So if OU was so happen to beat them in the Red River rivalry game, they would, their win would look really good. I mean, I want to know which way they're thinking on that one. Leave a That's comment if how you feel it on that one. It's like, do, do you want a, a pissed off Texas team coming into that game off of like a heartbreaking loss to Kansas or like a bad loss to Kansas? Or um, you... Tom, this is Tom. This is one of the biggest rivalries in college football. They're going to be mad either way. OU and Texas, they're going to be mad. No, nah, I think worry about any of that. I, I think Tom. I mean, I think OU. I think you want Texas fat and happy and five and zero. Oh. Um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying that Texas is going to come into the game like, oh yeah, <laughs> super super excited. I mean, like it's. Of course, it's a rivalry. They're going to be amped up. But if you're coming off a loss, like you have yeah. a little extra chip on your shoulder, like do you, do you want to play good teams off? Or do you want to? Yeah, it's... generally. Yeah, no. Texas five and zero, having beat OU by near fifty points last year. If there's any chance for them to take OU lightly at all, <laughs> that would be it. So I think that's what you you bank on. Although OU fans are not. I mean, I I don't think OU fans root for Texas to win in any circumstance at any. No matter what, it could be. So you think this the lose against Kansas is what they're thinking? Oh, I mean, yeah. what? Like, oh, you Twitter's not going to have a field day if they lose to Kansas. Of course they will. Yeah, of course you want to be a party. Yeah, and we'll know. We'll know. That's an afternoon game on Saturday, so we'll, we'll know before you kicks off. We'll mm-hmm. know. So looking forward to it. Going to be a fun one this weekend. Be sure to keep up with Oklahoma. Twenty four seven Sports dot com. Sooners Illustrated. 
for all the coverage leading up to the start of this game on Saturday. And, of course, post-game reaction from the three of us, Colin Kennedy, Brent Venables, um, obviously Dylan Gabriel, coordinators, players, all that good stuff will live on the site as well as on the YouTube channel, Sooners Illustrated, Oklahoma Sooners on 24-7 Sports. Become a VIP subscriber. Be up to the date, up to the latest on uh, recruiting news, team news, all that good stuff leading up to the start of this game uh, as we get closer to the midway point already. Texas game next weekend. Look forward to this one, though. Back home under the lights.